Hello, and welcome to the Breaking Silos Building Informed Platforms webinar. This is a follow-up webinar to the March 19th through the 21st, 21st CII Technology Showcase Fiatech in San Antonio. This is Kimon Onuma from Onuma Inc. And we have Stephen Hagen from Hagen Technologies on with us as well. Steve, would you like to say hello? Yeah, thank you, Kimon. I'm looking forward to this and um, sharing some more information at the end of your webinar. Thank you. Great. Thanks for joining us today. So what we're doing today is we are actually doing a follow-up to the live session we had uh, in San Antonio several weeks ago where we actually interacted with the audience. And this is a result of the interaction and uh, some introductory slides and some other new information as well um, toward the end of the webinar. Um, for those that would like to post any questions in the GoToWebinar panel on the right, there's a uh, questions tab. If you pull that down and type in your question throughout the webinar, uh, as we have time toward the end, we'll address some of the questions. So let's get started here. So one introduction as far as the, the complexity of the industry and the technologies around us and the complexity of information about the built environment, we've reached our maximum ability to uh, count and manage that complexity as humans. And we hear a lot about uh, AI and where automation is going to be going and all the, the uh, disruptions that are going to happen. But we see it as an opportunity for those that see how they can use the technology uh, effectively, it, it actually improves our ability to see things, to forecast what's happening in the future, and to identify new opportunities that would not be possible if we did not have the machines. Now, if we just let the machines take over, yeah, there's a lot of things that can get automated, but those that um, the, the, the danger is that if we don't embrace the, what's already happening around us, there's no change to that uh, and find the opportunities, then, then, it, then it is a risk, but we see it as an opportunity. So from the building information modeling perspective and building industry perspective, we tend to get attracted by shiny objects, by the, the complexity and the great things that the technologies can do. And there are some amazing things too. It's not to discredit all the amazing technologies that are out there with building information modeling and geographic information systems and facility management. Uh, but for example, with BIM, if you search for BIM on Google, and uh, there's a lot of diagrams that kind of show BIM being at the center of the universe, kind of everything ties into it. And conceptually, that's an okay concept. But throughout the life cycle, as a project progresses, there's really nothing at the center. It's, it's really much more flat. And if we think in terms of BIM being at the center or a single model or the BIM uh, getting more complex over time and we're adding more geometry and adding more data, that naturally happens. But it really is not even one BIM or one thing at the center. And think in terms of data and technologies, there's a lot of different sources of information that change throughout the life cycle. And the, the need for more information is obvious as a project progresses. But the other part of this is how do we uh, simplify and make it easy to get to? Um, so the level of detail or level of development, um, more buttons don't doesn't necessarily mean better. Uh, more buttons kind of evolved uh, from the, our past in these boom boxes to what you're, we're used to today. And in many ways, less is more. If we can get to the uh, the uh, tsunami of information that's available to us in a simple way. That's what we really need. We need the information that we need at that point in time. And that has dramatically shifted in the last uh, uh, five years, 10 years, or even a few years, uh, our expectations of getting to data in a simple way. It's, it's just the norm now. So how do we bring the building industry into this? Um, so that's really the opportunity. And there's really almost like two camps to the technology world. Uh, it's easier than ever to build software and software is now a commodity. This was an article in TechCrunch. Uh, and there's also an art, another article in Business Insider about a 16 year old kid who fell behind in math class. So he built an app to do it. Why is this even possible? It's possible because there are platforms now that you can quickly build solutions on top of and the apps are becoming disposable. Uh, it's becoming easier to create solutions. It's becoming easier to move your data from the applications or the applications of the past to the apps of the present and to even throw away the apps that you've downloaded yesterday and no longer works for you and you move on to the next app 
or the next um, mobile device, even the mobile devices, you can lose your iPhone or your Android phone and log right into the cloud and pick up where you left off. You don't have to worry about moving the data is no longer stored on the device, it's stored elsewhere. So you, the app, the hardware and the software becomes secondary to the data itself. And that's a, that's a critical shift that has happened in the industry. And the building industry is still um, not completely embracing this. It's starting to move in this direction, but that is an opportunity for how we, we manage the tsunami of data that Steve is gonna be talking about later. There's so much data that it's absolutely impossible to manage it in a single application or with the tools of the past and even the processes of the, of the past. And that's the opportunity that we see in the building industry and the AEC world and not just for design and construction, but for the full life cycle. So today we're gonna to be talking a lot about um, owner requirements into the design and construction process and even looking at the entire life cycle. Um, the applications of the past and the processes of the past, which were the industry is still pretty much stuck on today too, in many ways, but it's, it's changing rapidly, is uh, data uh, was moved from one silo to the next, almost like a dump truck that you had to process it and put it into a BIM and then dump it out of the BIM and put it into construction model from design to construction and then to operations and then looking at the entire life cycle and at that urban and world scale. Uh, this method is not sustainable. It's um, a method from the past. It's still being used, but we need to look at opportunities of how we change this waterfall approach to data just being dumped from one silo to the next. And really that's what the platform concept is, is really all about. Platforms enable us to think in terms of data as being flat and being accessible at any point in time and only getting the data that you need instead of having the full, for example, putting all the data into a model and having to extract it and then going back to that 16 year old building the app. If you have a platform like iOS or Android, you can build new applications on top of that. And architecture can be a platform or construction can be a platform or owner requirements can be a platform um, that if the data is made accessible, then you can build new functionality on top of that. And that's what this session was really all about. Imagine a world where the owner's data is an actual platform and that owner's data is made accessible and the, the architects and the designers and builders and engineers can get to it and then it can live all the way into facility management. And it's not a single platform either. That's the other important concept. It's a, it's a combination of platforms that talk to each other. And that's why this whole uh, diagram that we're used to seeing for BIM being in the center and everything radiating around it, conceptually it's correct, but functionally and from a technology perspective, it's the wrong idea. It's an idea from the past of we put things, data into one system and then we figure out which system to use. So it's really about flattening out that, that uh, ability to get to data. So finding data has been a, a difficult thing. So owner's requirements, for example, are stacked into paper documents or PDF files or even BIMs uh, that are hard to get to. And uh, through a project that uh, Steve and I worked on for the uh, National Institute of Building Sciences for the Department of Defense and VA, we developed a process where we said, okay, you have data. If you, as an owner, if you put that on the web and you let the industry get to it, then you're gonna have a much more efficient way of communicating your requirements to the industry. And the same data can make its way all the way into facility management and operations. So this is an actual functioning website and you'll see some other presentations that are recorded on the bimstorm.com site where you can see demonstrations of this. This is actual owner data you can go into and pull up requirements for a healthcare facility. So at the uh, CII conference a few weeks ago, we decided to open this process up and um, do what's called a BIM storm. BIM storm has been going on for a decade now. We've had uh, thousands of participants, almost 40 BIM storms by now, I think, that uh, we had participants collaborating from around the world through the web um, and uh, using many different tools, uh, connecting to each other and using data and, and the focus is on flowing data between teams and tools regardless of what applications you're using. The latest one was called Planes, Trains and Automobiles and it's been going on since last summer. Um, and it's about focusing on airports but using the healthcare um, uh, platform that, that was developed for the DOD and VA, the, the concepts of that whether you call this a, a healthcare facility or an airport or an office or a school, the process is exactly the same and the challenges are exactly the same. Owner's data and 
static analog format that's hard to get to, that you have to go through thousands and thousands of pages to find requirements of uh, what are the wingtip clearances between planes at an airport, and what are the TSA requirements for circulation, et cetera, all, all of that, and what, what adjacency requirements are there. So through a series of uh, exercises with um, uh, Giuliani Associates and other architects and engineers at our airport uh, planners, we, we um, created a, a space and equipment uh, templates for an air airport. It's the beginning, it's still a beta format, but it has all the rules embedded in it. And that's what we used at the CII conference and at other conferences. So this started in July of last year through with Giuliani and Associates of collecting the rules and, and cataloging them and putting them into a data format that made it easily accessible, putting them on a website, uh, putting them on a uh, server and getting making act, giving access to them. And then we said, okay, if, if we can make this as simple as possible for even non-planners and even non-architects for that matter, let's imagine the airport owner uh, that wants to put in requirements for uh, 10 new gates at an airport, what would that look like? So at every conference, uh, we've had uh, five sessions so far starting in November uh, that each were about uh, some of the sessions were like an hour presentation or 30 minutes presentation out of those 45 minutes or an hour presentations we took 10 to 15 minutes with the audience and said well go to this website and pretend you're an owner and send in the requirements of what you want to build and at some conferences it was an airport focused conference so the san diego one was airport consultants council the audience in uh, 10 minutes submitted over a million square feet of facilities uh, in BIM uh, with a lot of equipment and data associated with it. Uh, in Washington, D.C., a week later, the same thing with the uh, National Academy of Sciences Asset Leadership Network, over 2 million square feet. Construction Users Roundtable uh, was not as much focused on airports, but there was a lot of offices and educational facilities in some airport. So the square footage is a little bit less because the, obviously airports can be, get large pretty quickly. And then at the airport planning design and construction symposium in Denver, uh, 1.6 million square feet. And a few weeks ago in San Antonio, which we're, we're focusing on today, uh, 2.7 million square feet. So over the last um, six months or so, uh, we've had over 8 million square feet submitted by the audience with minimal, no training actually. We just said go to the site and try and we'll show you a little bit of that today as well too. And this is, we're gonna show the results of that process. So this is Denver. Uh, um, two new terminals were created. Uh, this is all hypothetical, obviously, and the reason we're doing BIM storms is it takes it out of the contractual and the actual project environment and opens it up as a sandbox to say, what would it look like? And this goes back to the discussion I had earlier about the level of detail for BIM. You'll notice that the design is not resolved here yet, but it's getting pretty close. Uh, with it, Pretty rapidly, you can get the requirements in place and do test fits quickly. And obviously, that's as a designer, as an architect, I can look at this now and start getting creative with this and even changing things and adjusting sizes. So this is not a fixed design. You can obviously automate a lot of this, but there still needs to be the creative part of how do you resolve a request like this from an owner that might be completely wrong for that matter. It might be, well, this is the wrong assumption. We have to change things. Um, and this is the Construction Users Roundtable in Chandler, Arizona. This is the actual hotel um, in Chandler that we were having the conference in, and we ended up parking the programmatic requirements from the audience there. Uh, we took over the golf course. It was kind of just arbitrary, but this is the, uh, the program for a school and a clinic and a office building parked right next to the conference facility. So at the CII conference, which we're going to show a little bit more of today, uh, 15 minutes. It was a one hour presentation where I did an introduction and then I opened it up to the audience and we had a lot of square footage coming in from the audience there during the, uh, the conference, over 2.7 million square feet. Um, and we'll show a little bit of that, the results of that. So in that 15 minutes, we had 197 aircraft. We, we were uh, submitted, uh, part of the audience was submitting for airports, and this is basically aircraft and, and airport drive the need for space. And knowing the type of aircraft that's coming in throughout the day uh, defines how many gates you might need. Uh, so there's a lot of wide bodies, that, again, with no instructions to the audience, they were basically picking off what they thought would make sense for an airport, whether they were an airport planner or not. So the exercise was not necessarily to, to solve the challenge, the design challenge, but to show the process. 
Um, this is the program for the airport. These are all the spaces uh, um, automatically just uh, arranged. Uh, you, you can see kind of groupings of spaces, and these are different people that have submitted different parts of it. Uh, there were over um, uh, 1,300 spaces with about 15,000 pieces of equipment in it. And this goes back to the level of detail, level development discussion. You see these colored blocks. If we open up these blocks inside them, there are um, pieces of equipment and furniture, and there are other attributes about characteristics of that space. You know, is it, a, it, is it an airport waiting lounge, or is it an operating room, or is it a school? Uh, that drives different discussions about how to solve this from a design perspective. These are the school facilities that were submitted, uh, classrooms and meeting rooms and offices, 719 spaces, 21,000 pieces of equipment, 196,000 square feet of educational facilities uh, uh, waiting to be designed, basically. Uh, this is the clinic, and in this view, we've turned on the equipment so you can actually see every chair and table that's required in this clinic. And this is based on the DOD and VA, the SEPS to BIM process of the VA and DOD healthcare requirements of the spaces. So 577 spaces, 112,000 square feet net uh, of facilities. And then offices, uh, 27,300 uh, office spaces, 27,000 pieces of equipment. So these four types of facilities were then, we, we used the National Mall in Washington, D.C. over the last week to do an exercise of what would that look like if we landed the program for all the offices. That's what's in the foreground there. The office spaces landed there, I think it's 120,000 square feet. Then the, um, the clinic space uh, right there. And then the airport, uh, a couple million square feet of airport space. And you can see it pretty much takes over things right there. And then the um, uh, uh, educational facilities. So that, this is all a flattened view of all the program of 2.7 million square feet. And then this is a, a stacked view of the 2.7 million square feet. This is an automatic stacking of what would it look like, the massing. Obviously, you wouldn't stack an airport to be 10 stories high, but this is what it would look like if we landed it on the mall as far as from a, uh, a massing perspective of what is needed. Then since we were in San Antonio, we decided, okay, let's take the airport and actually do an expansion of San Antonio Airport. Uh, San Antonio Airport did not ask us to do this. We basically just picked it and said, okay, here's uh, from, if we started landing the program that was generated by the audience here in San Antonio, what would it look like if we needed a new airport in 2025? So we picked a part of the airport that had an open green space. We don't know if that's the correct place to put it or not, but this is a first discussion Within a few minutes, we said, okay, what would this look like? Here is the result of the airport uh, terminals arranged with the same program, program areas. And then the, uh, the other three building types on the left, the offices, the clinic, and the, uh, the school facilities that are not resolved yet. They're, they're waiting to be designed. But the airport is getting closer to having uh, the, uh, the layout that might work in a scenario like this. And even at this low level of detail in the early planning stages, we start generating um, um, energy use and utility use. And this is kind of starts the discussion based on the programmatic elements that have been placed in, uh, uh, on the site. And in other BIM storms on previous seminar, um, uh, conferences, we did other more detailed designs of the clinics. This is one, uh, one view of it. And then this, the exact same data then starts moving into uh, tools like SketchUp and, and Revit. And that's a key thing as part of these BIM storms is regardless of what tools you're using, you want to see the same information, whether it's a block diagram or whether you're detailing all the way down to the space. You don't necessarily have to turn on all the furniture when you're doing a, a massing study. But if you have the IDs lined up from a technology perspective, it's actually relatively straightforward if the IDs and the naming and numbering is consistent then you can get data to move across different systems. Uh, this is another view of a different, uh, different conferences at the Asset Leadership Network, another airport view laid out flat, very large terminal, probably too large, but this is all the uh, requirements that came in from the audience. And then uh, the clinic model then pulled into Revit with the same uh, equipment data in it. Um, the Denver airport. So conceptually, what we showed just now, and I'll, I'll open some things live in the next year, is that if the owner at least gets their basic data in order, 
rather than sharing it as a PDF file or as a static Excel file. Uh, if they have it on the web, then we can get to it and pull it into the design and construction process. And the objective really is not only to focus on separate silos, but to move the same data all the way into operations and facilities and even an urban world scale. If you imagine an owner with a lot of portfolio, if they have consistent data, uh, it's actually a relatively simple first step rather than having the complexity of the full model or being stuck on the design and construction of the BIM, all important stuff, but it's, it's an opportunity to get the data in order. And this is being repeated by other owners now. So that's another pitch I would make here is that this does not have to be reinvented. Other owners can actually use this process. And we are we have been talking with other owners to basically adjust the healthcare requirements to other building types that can be used. So it becomes a platform. This is really a platform of enabling technologies and architecture and construction and operations. And the owners would have their own platform that, that ties into this overall concept. So just to show a few things live next, um, let's go into what we started with. Actually, if you go to the BIMSTORM site, you will see uh, some previous presentations. Um, you can see some of the uh, the results of those here. The CII conference that we're talking about today is under the CII tab, uh, and we'll be posting more information there as well, too. Uh, and then there's other uh, presentations that, that can be spotted as well, too. Okay, so let's go into sepstabim.org is the uh, DOD and BA website um, that you can actually go, and this is public, sepstabim.org, uh, you can go and actually build up a program. So if you want to have a dental room and uh, uh, some kind of an office or an exam screening room, I'm selecting one of each here. And just you can search or just scroll down. And then this creates a shopping cart, just like an Amazon shopping cart. And it's building a BIM uh, from the owner's data. And that's the instruction that we gave to uh, the audience. Uh, at the CII conference is go and build up a program like this and put in your email address and it would get sent to you looking kind of like this. This is a, a result, one sample result in real time uh, that was generated just uh, right before the, the session today, but you can do it live as well. And it builds a BIM uh, with their data. Uh, it's the square footage of the space and the equipment that they want in the space. You'll notice that the space is a little bit too small for all the equipment that is in their database. This, this is a kind of a view of um, what is possible uh, once you start to, um, uh, to see the information in a graphical format in BIM. And you can take this out to Revit or Arcata SketchUp. That's the process that we use that I demonstrated earlier of how you would see this in Revit or SketchUp or Google Earth. Um, and the uh, particular exercise with the, um, uh, the CII conference attendees was at, on the program to BIM site, program to BIM.com. You can actually go into the different tabs and find different um, building types, same process again, you would select um, uh, transportation spaces and aircraft, you know, how many airplanes do you want or how many uh, classrooms do you want and build up a shopping cart of that program. You can put more than one if you want and then you go to the shopping cart and it, it totals up uh, the selection and gives you the total square foot. So this is them being built from an interface, it doesn't require you to even know what BIM is. It's basically an owner's uh, requirements, what they think they want for an educa educational facility or an airport. And this is manually selecting the pieces. There are other parts of this process that automate, that connect, can connect to other algorithms or rules that say if you have this many patients and you need this much space. And we actually have a new tab called Program Sets, which we'll be using more at the AIA conference that Steve's going to talk about later, where we actually, you don't have to go through and manually select sets, but you actually have groupings of spaces. So I can say a pull down here and say I want to find uh, three narrow body planes uh, for transportation or six narrow body and wide body planes. I have six planes for an airport. What do I need for that? You submit it and it basically builds up a... Um, a recipe, a kit of parts basically of all the spaces that you might need for an airport like this. And you'll notice that it actually has quantities already filled in and you can change those as well. And it rapidly builds up rather than manually going through. So it's basically, you can either select manually or you can go and uh, build them on the fly with these uh, program sets, which we will be expanding 
on the program to BIM site. Okay, so let's uh, take a look back at the um, slides. And while Steve starts speaking, after Steve finishes speaking, I'm going to open up uh, some Google Earth views of the results that I showed earlier uh, as static images and see if we can get them running uh, through this webinar. Um, so the architecture as a platform and uh, breaking silos and going into platforms theme is going to continue. Uh, we have uh, several conferences coming up over the next uh, few months. One of them is at the uh, AIA Conference on Architecture in June in New York City. Uh, we have a session called Architecture as a Platform for the New Urban Agenda. It's a little bit of a mouthful, but the theme of the entire AIA conference is the New Urban Agenda. It's a United Nations a document that talks about um, how things should change. There's 175 points in the document, a lot of data again, but we're focusing on how architecture and technology can actually enable uh, meeting those goals of the urban agenda. Um, so you'll find more information on the bimstorm.com site to a lot of these sessions. Um, we showed a lot of different technologies today, including Google Earth and Revit and SketchUp. Uh, we also have our own tool the on, called the Onuma system, which uh, the, uh, the, the shopping cart and the configuration of BIM in a simple way and then going into the life cycle, you can actually check it out on onuma.com, see more information on that. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Steve if you're on, if your audio yep, is I'm on, on Steve. I'm on here, come on, thank you very much. And I think what you, what uh, everyone has seen is just uh, an amazing um, amount of versatility with uh, what Kimona has been doing with, with building information modeling, and really we're making the step towards digital transformation. But one of the things we're talking about with this tsunami of new um, technologies and innovations that's coming toward us is taking a look at uh, big data, um, cloud computing, uh, drones, uh, mobile devices, um, augmented reality, virtual reality, a lot of new technologies that really can enhance what we're doing as architects and all of the stakeholders in the billing process. And so for the last three AIA conventions, we've had sessions about this game-changing innovation. We had a workshop that was highly um, interactive last year in Orlando, and we're doing this again this year um, in a series of, um, of sessions on uh, June 21st, very early morning, 7 7.30 and then 9.30, um, in New York City. Um, and it starts out with looking at these innovations from a kind of architects uh, and construction industry perspective, and then follows up with a session very specific to the topic of that conference on architecture, which is a new urban agenda. So we're very delighted to kind of continue this, and I think it's continuing to grow. We've had great turnout, great response, uh, a lot of feedback, and we really hope that um, everyone on the call will join us in this movement um, and continue to participate. And then do you want to mention the, the AC next as well? Come on. Yeah, it's coming up at the end here. Okay. This is the uh, report on integrated practice from 2006, if you can cover that. Oh, a little bit oh yeah, definitely. So we, we're really looking at reaching all the way back to um to you know almost 12 years ago when we were um working at the uh, working on AIA technology and practice and the uh, American Institute of Architects had a whole movement um related to um change uh and the industry and there was lots of um there's a whole report that was created there was a there's a lot of interest at the time, and we've been continuing to kind of integrate that into what we're doing. So there's a continuum over time, but I think if you look at that slide of the tsunami, we're, think we're seeing all of this innovation is accelerating. And so it's really kind of starting to make your head spin. And so what do you do? How do you get your mind around it? What kind of approach should you take to really be productive, not be overwhelmed, but harness 
And that's one of the terms of our first session is harness this technology and then really make it a part of your professional lives and your practice and what you do every day. Yeah, it's actually interesting in 2006 as part of that report, there were uh, I think 12 articles and one of them was by Tom Main. Um, yep. who basically in 2006 was saying you won't recognize a profession a decade from now. We're more than a decade from that statement. Um, do you think we've come there or have you reached that, that uh, realization or has the um, industry changed? Uh, and Tom well, was saying, uh, if you don't change, you're going to perish back then. Um, where are well, we? And I, think, I, I, I think that was absolutely true. And I, I think that there has been adoption. There has been... Um, new um, new ways of doing things. People have become more efficient. There's new forms of the build environment. Um, we are, I think, more sustainable and more resilient because of this technology. But um, on top of that, as robotics and artificial intelligence and machine learning, that um, one can see as a threat, but I would say it's also a way to augment um, what you are doing on a daily basis and really making you far more efficient and effective and delivering better outcomes. Uh, and, you know, you have an example of that from all of the BIM storm projects, but that can really happen. And that's kind of a question that we ask in these workshops and sessions um, is, so how do I integrate that? And how do you make it, take it home and really work on your projects in your firm, in your practice, to make them a reality. Right. Yeah, and I think a lot of these, um, there's a lot of great, amazing stuff happening in the technologies, no question about that. How do we apply that to the industry, to the AAC industry, I think is a, a big question. And we've been, over the years, we've been kind of used to thinking in terms of we're consumers of the technology. We're now actually, just like the, that 16-year-old I was talking about building apps, we should become more not only consumers of, but actually developers of solutions and even the concept of architecture as a platform and in, 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 in the technology world it's even called architecture right? Um, right the difficult part is not actually coding it's actually understanding the domain and architects and engineers and builders definitely do have domain expertise and in the past, that kind of domain expertise was transferred over to the technology developers who would build the solutions. And that's still going to continue, and that's still of great value. But if we flip it around and think in terms of us being the consumers and the developers of solutions as domain experts, I think that's an important discussion to have. So it's not just, well, here are all the great tools out there. Go buy this, and you can do it. Well, yeah, that's, that's part of it. That, that's a very small part, though. And that's what I think the shift that's happening everywhere else outside of the building industry. The building industry is, the shift is already, we're starting to see things starting to change. And if we don't get ahead of that, we're gonna lose that opportunity. Yeah, but absolutely. the main message here at this, as part of this set of slides is that this is not a new discussion. This has been on the horizon for many years, over a decade or more. And now it's actually starting to happen in the last few years, but we really have to, to grasp that opportunity. Yep. Maybe talk a little bit about the GSA and the model checking a little bit. This is just a few of the slide, teaser slides from well, and, the and you know what we're, what we're talking about when we really start to use building information modeling and and then tools like model checking um, is that we can really make some amazing leaps in terms of analyzing different problems that we have. And, uh, and many of our projects are very complex. And so in this case, it was um, a new courthouse. There are complex zones for security between the judge and his staff, the public coming in, and then the prisoners. Uh, uh, and so you have to work uh, and you and then you obviously have some very creative architects that are creating um, interesting configurations to the building, and yet it has to work. And so in this case, we had um, model checking, uh, a, a model created, and then work between GSA and Georgia Tech and a tool called Salibri Model Checker. And we actually ran all of those scenarios against some constraints that were built in that looked at 
what would work and what wouldn't work. And what's amazing is how quickly you can run through massive number of iterations, look at problems, have them flagged, and then come back and start working on them again, as opposed to some things you would never be able to see if you were uh, a human look, trying to look through all those things. So that's really the power. What we see is the power of, of digital computation and automation that really we really have been talking about for this whole session. Right. What's interesting about this image here is that this obviously is a model of from BIM somewhere, but it has kind of a subset of that model that's being analyzed as far as exiting. So it doesn't have, you know, the, the door hardware. It might have the information yeah. about the door hardware, actually, wouldn't it? It would say, okay, this door is an exit door or whatever. But yeah. it's that view that I was talking about earlier of what's important for that particular use case or that user's perspective. So if you're doing an analysis of circulation routes, then you need this level of detail of the model. But imagine if you were an occupant of that building and there was an emergency and you needed to find the exit with whatever the heads up displays that are coming up or the embedded in our glasses or whatever is going to happen. It's really a very specific instruction that says, turn left here, go down the stair exit building. It's a, it's a BIM, but it's a very small part of the BIM. And the user in that scenario doesn't even have to know what BIM is. They just need to get out of the building. Um, and I think from an urban scale, maybe this ties back to the urban agenda discussion. Imagine a city that had this level of information that was accessible to the right people. Now, there's obviously security issues and who should get to the data and all that in there as well, too. But you don't have to download the entire model to say, turn left here, go down three flights, and you're out of the building. Um, that's a specific instruction set almost like an Uber, you know, where do, I, where do I pick up my Uber on the corner of the street? It's all, it's very similar to that concept in many ways uh, uh, that coming from the BIM building perspective. And I think that concept there is an important one that we have to think in terms of from the AEC world, how do we strip away what's not important and not necessarily throw it away, but how do we, how do we deliver it to the end user in their perspective and still be tied back to the bigger picture. Absolutely, yeah. So, I, yeah. The uh, next slide. Yeah, so AC next, let's talk. Go ahead and you can introduce. Yeah. What are we doing here? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I think we're continuing continuing the movement here with some um, sessions that combine all of the work that you've been talking about with BIMSTORM and all of these innovations that we've been uh, uh, continuing to examine um, and, and in a you know town hall type session with all of the attendees we're really getting a lot of feedback about what's important where do where do we put our efforts and how do we actually work together and share um, our expertise and our challenges in this area All right ahead, you... there's going to be uh, eight seven or eight sessions, I believe, at AC Next Conference. If you go to acst.com and just search BIMSTORM, um, there's different presentations from owners and uh, architects and engineers and planners and blockchain, where we have a session on blockchain and open source tools and standards and all very important information um, related to the building industry. Um, and um, it's going to be in June from June 5 to 7 in Anaheim, California. Um, if you go to acnextst.com, you can sign up there. And there's also another one coming up at the end of the year in Washington, DC. But we just have the Anaheim, California ones planned out now for the BIM storm sessions. Yeah, um, so we're really we're really encouraging everyone that's interested in this to, to, give, to send us a message, stay connected with us, and, and really participate in the movement. Yeah. So there's AACST in Anaheim. Uh, there's the AIA conference on, and toward the end of June in New York City. And then there's another conference on healthcare, which I will be presenting at um, in a few weeks here, uh, the end of the month uh, in yep. April in um, Williamsburg, Virginia. We'll be presenting with uh, Broadus and Associates uh, in Onuma for the um, SEPS to BIM healthcare work. So you notice that we're bouncing around between different project types. There's airports, there's healthcare, there's education. Uh, really, in the end, it, if you take the, word, the specific name of the project type out of there, the underlying process and the tools and technologies are very similar. And in the harness session also, Steve, we're also looking beyond what 
would be traditionally thought of as you know AC related technologies is there's a ton of other technologies out there like you mentioned drones and we're talking about blockchain and other technologies out there that are shifting the rest of the world that we really need to harness and use uh, in this industry and it's really up to us to to make that shift yeah and there's no question that there's new players coming online i mean we're we've got amazon we've got apple with all of the devices we've got google um, and they're all creating these innovations that we can harness um, for ourselves and it's just a matter of so what's your strategy and how do you do that and so we're really trying to to uh, uh to enable that and encourage people to share that as much as possible all right exactly um so one question that came in is what our owner is actually asking for and paying for. We've noticed a pattern that it's it's almost the exact same thing. All the owners are looking for some type of solution to become more efficient at how they work on projects and, and uh, how they, they work with their data. Um, and they want to manage the entire life cycle. They want to go from end to end, from we're thinking of building a project, should we build it, what should it be, all that discussion about the, the, the reason for building. Then in design and construction, obviously, there's a lot of great examples in BIM of what, what shift is happening there. But also, more importantly, going beyond just a single building and project and going to facility life cycle and operations. If we're managing a single building or even uh, 10 buildings or 1,000 buildings, how, how can we be consistent about making decisions of where do we build next or what do we, how, how much energy is being used? All of those discussions about reducing energy use, for example, it's not going to, we're not going to get to the 2030 goals with the traditional uh, waterfall approach to managing information. We need to get that data in a format that can be used across the whole life cycle in a flat format. And that's what the owners are asking for. They don't know the answers, but what we're bringing to them is a consistent approach that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, let's use what other owners are doing. Uh, let's look at standards that are being developed out there. Let's look at open source tools. Let's look at looking at your data and making it accessible, uh, surfacing the data in a consistent way, um, that's that's a common theme that we're getting from owners. And also starting simple, uh, going back to the BIM slide at the very beginning that we had, we're all naturally drawn to, wow, look at all this complex, great stuff that BIM can do. Fantastic, but if we overwhelm the end user, especially the owner, for example, that knows very little about BIM, um, they, it, it can be overwhelming to, to even know where to start. But there are simple ways to start that have a huge benefit. And part of the presentation here that we showed is that even getting your very simple requirement data in order trickles down all the way into BIM and can start automatically generating a requirement BIM that can be used in the design and construction process. That's an important theme that we're getting. And nobody needs to understand the whole picture, just like the, um, the exiting slide that we looked at at the very end that Steve was talking about. The occupant of the building doesn't have to know about BIM, but they need to get out of the building. Uh, getting out of the building information originated in BIM somewhere, and it's of incredible value to the occupant in an emergency, uh, as one example. So the very specific use case is that you, you can consume just the data you need and nothing else, just like this 16-year-old that was building these apps. Uh, you wanted to create an app that would find out how to, the formulas for um, figuring out the hyperbola of, uh, in, in math. So he created it and that was it. You enter the information, it pushes the information back to you. The, the generation that, that's growing up with these mobile devices, their expectation is nothing less. They, they expect to be able to get information very simply. Um, question is, how is the information vetted? Um, so the question of accuracy of information. What we found, going back to the owner data that we talked about here, a lot of great information in the wrong format that cannot be easily vetted that might be 10 years old. And this is a, a, a specific example about healthcare, but it runs across the board. So for example, if healthcare owner says, this is how we put together an operating room, and this is an actual sketch from a design session that we sat in with an architect uh, as they were defining the requirements. Look at all the data that's being collected here. We're not against sketches, but we're against storing information in an analog format that gets that makes it hard to get to, even as a PDF stuck on a website. So we said, okay, all of this data, if you surface it, 
then you can vet and say which one is wrong. Is that the right type of light exam light that should go in the room, which is an actual example that we, we saw in their data. We said, well, this light fixture looks like it's a specification from 10 years ago. It's not an LED light. If you can't see the information, then you can't vet it. As soon as you surface it, you can quickly find patterns and look at errors that show up. Um, and actually, that was an error that I showed earlier with this, uh, this view that we looked at here. This blue box is a square footage that is in the database for this room. This equipment is what is in the database this morning, actually, in the VA database of their requirements of what should go in the room. Can you, as an architect, resolve this room with this equipment? It looks pretty tight to me. Um, so my first recommendation to the owner, and if a design requirement came across that, that looked like this, I could say, well, we either need to get rid of equipment or we need to make this room bigger. In their database, this room is shown as the actual square footage of what the size of the room needs to be with this equipment. So that's a form of vetting. As soon as you can surface the data, then you can quickly filter and find stuff. And there are errors. And these errors like this, in the traditional process, what we found are errors are, are constantly being sent out to the design teams. And the design teams are having to resolve this for every single project that comes along. But as soon as you have it in BIM and in a data format, it becomes much easier to find and get to that information. So how is the Revit content vetted? Another question about the Revit content. Um, in this particular scenario, there are Revit families that are generic objects. They're not the final design. This is not a view of the final design. This is what the owner thinks they want in the, the building. The Revit um, templates are automatically generated in this case, these spaces and equipment, because the equipment is coming from the database, was vetted with 2,000 pieces of equipment that you can actually find on the, uh, uh, in the SEPS to BIM process. If you look at, uh, let me open the website here just to respond to that question. If you go to SEPS to BIM.org, this is a VA and DOD's uh, uh, website that has all of these um, um, equipment and templates that you can build on the fly. And at the very bottom are links to, to content, the Revit files and everything. But what we set up and recommended for them is that the Revit templates and the BIMs are generated from data. So as their data in their database changes, here's their data, it gets driven up into the objects to generate the templates. So that was um, <clears throat> kind of a long answer to a short question, but there's a lot more to this. But uh, um, it basically it goes back to the concept that if you get back to the original data, you can start developing solutions from that. And if the underlying data changes, so if an, in the owner's platform, if the requirements for healthcare facilities changes, it trickles all the way up into the, the requirement templates, into the design, into construction. Those IDs make their way all the way into, now we have that operating room sitting in Washington, DC. What's that piece of equipment? and how many of those types of spaces do we have in our portfolio. Okay, um, I think that's it. Steve, do you have any final thoughts here? I think we've covered a lot here, but... Uh, no, we have covered that. a lot, and I don't know if anybody else has uh, in the audience has any questions, but we'd certainly be happy to, uh, if we have your email, connect with you, uh, encourage you to stay in touch, and really share with us your own experiences and your own feedback. We're certainly um, welcome to find out what, how others are finding success uh, or challenges along the way. Uh, but we do see this, uh, there, there's been a lot of very big reports by McKinsey at the World Economic Forum about digital transformation of our industry. Um, unfortunately, I think since, you know, we've been at this for 20 plus years, uh, of our career, and we're still at the be beginning of it, and the tsunami of uh, technologies and innovation is overwhelming at the same time. But running the running, rather than running away, let's try to harness those energies uh, in the right direction. And I think uh, this has been a great presentation. Thank you, Kwan. Thanks, Steve. And here's a result of the uh, CII um, airport submittals on the San Antonio airport landed. Uh, this is a few minute exercise of taking the pieces and putting them there. And as far as reaching Steve and I, Steve, you're on uh, uh, Twitter and uh, um, LinkedIn, and you also have a flip. We have a Flipboard site for the AC Game Changers. You can look at. 
Um, you can reach me also on Twitter and LinkedIn and the BIMSTORM site, BIMSTORM.com. We're going to continue with these live exercises and the results of the AIA conference and other conferences. You can follow that there. Uh, well, so and also there's an AEC, uh, I'm sorry, come on. There's also an AEC Game Changers um, a Twitter account, which is uh, has a lot right. of uh, activity there. So that's a great thing to look at as well. Yeah, that's right. And we'll be sending out some messages on, on all those accounts in the next uh, few weeks and months as we head into these conferences. All right, great. So I think we'll sign off with that. Oh, let's see. One more question. I think that's it. Thank you, everybody, everybody for listening. And uh, if you have any ideas or input, let us know. Thank Logging you. Off. Thank you. All. This is, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Steve, for joining us. Yeah. yeah thank this you. Come on, Steve. Thank you. Bye. Yeah.